City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Clerman Endowment. Presents Spotlight. Welcome to the Harold Klerman Seminar in Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is one of America's most talented playwrights, Marcia Norman. Welcome, Marcia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for being with us. Uh, I think probably your two best-known plays are Getting Out, about a young woman who got out of prison, and Night Mother, which won the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize and the Pulitzer Prize and many other awards, and I presume both of those plays have been done all over this country and indeed all over the world. Absolutely, there. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of your other plays. Good, good. Uh, and uh, both maybe the ones that came uh, before Night Mother and after Getting Out and some of the things you've been working on recently. I think one of the plays you've been working on is called Sarah and Abraham. Right. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, if I, you read a portion of that to Oh, a, that's a right. Class. That's right. I came to uh, class and read some. That's something. right. For, but uh, this, tell us a little about Sarah and Abraham. Sarah and Abraham is um, about a the, the feisty little theater troupe like Steppenwolf or one of those uh, in a Midwestern city that we don't know about uh, in the middle of a blizzard. Uh, this is a, a you know, small resident company of... Uh, Fanatics, really, uh, people who fanatical about the theater. About the theater, and they and the way they work, they improvise their way to their plays. Um, and so this time, uh, they've chosen the t the subject Sarah and Abraham, the Bible story. Um, they have in their midst uh, for this uh, production an actress from California, star starlet. If you is will. she visiting the troupe? She is. She is, and their desire to bring in um, some ticket money and get people in seats. Uh, she's there, uh, so she's kind of an outsider. And uh, the piece begins in the rehearsal hall as um, they come in from the blizzard and take off their coats and say, well, okay, what are we doing now and what do the costumes look like? Um, the, the director explains that he's been wanting to do this for a long time. He just didn't have the right people, but now that he has this gorgeous Hollywood actress uh, and he has his two old standbys, his, uh, his leading actress uh, and her husband, who's uh, also in the company, uh, he can do it now. He can do it, and he, he can tell the story of uh, who was Sarah and who was Abraham and what the hell happened to them, right, is what he says. Um, so the play is then the next, uh, it, it, it proceeds scene by scene um, to the final moment, which is the, the um, uh, um, full, pro at full production value, the final scene in the play that they create. So that, in a sense, what happens is, as you watch this piece materializes, the costumes come out of the trunks. The you know this bare rehearsal s space, this shabby-looking, awful thing, turns into this Bronze Age so desert the kingdom. Uh, the the play begins in the actors' mouths as they're sort of goofing off and trying to figure out what Sarah would have to say to Abraham. Um, and uh, here they hear parts of the story. G gradually, the the playwright, who is also a character in the piece, supplies, begins to supply the language, and you watch the play evolve. Now, what happens, really, is that you watch the marriage of this theatrical couple disintegrate, and, uh, and you watch the, um, the woman, um, in a sense, has to, uh, steps down from her role as leading actress of this company and uh, enters private life forever, and the man goes on to become, you know, the great and celebrated star that Abraham, of course, became. So uh, there's a parallel between yes. the Sarah and yes. Abraham story and between what right. happens in but real it, life yeah. to these actors. Yeah. There must be a lot about uh, the creation of a theatrical piece it in is. this. There is. I, I mean, mean somebody said to me, somebody, you know, they did a reading of it a uh, while ago, and a person from a newspaper said to me, well, wait a minute, you said that you always wrote about people who didn't have a voice of their own, couldn't speak for themselves, and so, and so isn't this a, I mean, aren't you really just, uh, you know, leaving behind your tradition? And I said, well, 
who has less of a voice than the actors in the plays that I write? I mean, this is <laughs> my giving them a chance to say, this is us back here. We're people back here. Our lives are falling apart. Our hearts are breaking. And yet we are, we, we are presenting to you these noble characters who somehow had another idea about how to live. Um, so it's really both about the process of uh, creating a theater piece, the lives of actors and actresses and directors. Right. And, but it's also the biblical story. Well, and, uh, it's is the it a story. Re, is it a reinterpretation of the biblical story? No, no. Uh, no, the, I tell the biblical story in a but, quite straightforward uh, way. My, my reading of the biblical story. I was going to say, don't you give Sarah... Uh, yes, is uh, that it's the story of a powerful woman uh, in a marriage. Um, and uh, Sarah... You know, I mean, then the Bible's the Bible scholars, again, you know, I do so much research in this. Uh, you did a great deal of yeah. biblical research for yeah. this. Uh, there, there are wonderful new, uh, there's wonderful new work about the Bible. Uh, I mean, one of the simple facts that, that's established you, you, you now mean, is that there, Sarah was a Mesopotamian priestess, you know, that she was uh, in charge. She was, you know, she did the rituals, she made it rain, she made the crops grow, she did that. And that... Uh, that this that she lived during a time when, in fact, things changed and people stopped worshiping the moon, started worshiping the sun, started worshiping commerce, not farming. Do you know? I mean, then that that was a real time when men, because of their who knows talents, their own power came into uh, control. And in so other words, the control shifted from yes, the woman to the man yes, historically yes, at this, yes. at this period. Yes, I mean, I, I really believe that what happened at some point back there was that the, the, uh, the mysteries were given over for the, for the, for the certainties, you know? And the mysteries yeah. of rain to the certainties of trade. Now, you, this brings us to a subject, uh, which is namely the whole notion of women's theater and women in the theater, mm. because you are now such a... Uh, to use a popular term, role model, I think, mm. and you're so involved because you have become so well known. Uh, the question of uh, female aesthetics and uh, the whole question of the role of women in the theater and the fact that there aren't that many women playwrights whose work is being done, there aren't that many women directors, what are some of your feelings about that? And have they changed over the years, your feelings about your responsibility as a woman writer? Well, I... I never, I, I didn't ever write anything because I felt I had to, because I wanted to make a point of any kind. Um, a political point. Right, yeah. right. Um, I only was writing stories that I knew and uh, moments of courage uh, that I was in awe of. And uh, women live courageous lives. Uh, and that, that courage, I mean, what, you, you have to look back at, well, you say, okay, it's Medea and Hedda Gabler. I mean, is that, are those the two courageous moments in the women's uh, theatrical history in the past? No, I mean, that's not enough. Um, and uh, I am, I am um, I think I'm greatly troubled by the fact that there are not more uh, young women coming up to write for the theater. Um, do you think they're not being given a chance? Or do you think they're... Wh what do you think is the reason for that? Well I, well, I don't know. I, I think that there are a couple of possible explanations. One is it's very... It's a very demanding uh, life in terms of time, uh, in terms of um, mobility. I mean, you have to be able to move around. Uh, if you have um, children and home to take care of, that's something that you might very well choose to do other than go and see a production in some place that <laughs> far away. Do you yes, know I mean? It's yes. a, those are very real choices, and women choose um, those. Uh, those um, w women make their choices in a different way, I think, than men do. I mean, it's very easy for women and very right, you know, and uh, powerful for women to say, I need to be with this child, I need to be in this house, and this is what I'm going to do now. So that in a sense, there's a great portion of women who w would be telling stories, who are doing something that they, uh, and we all would say, is as important. The, putting aside the question of uh, female aesthetics, right. uh, it, I think I do hear you saying there's a different sensibility and a different experience of the world right. that a Absolutely. woman has. Absolutely. And you did say, uh, in a, I'm just going to quote now a couple of things you said in, a, in an interview once, you, uh, on this subject. The things we as women know best have not been perceived to be of critical value to society. The mother-daughter relationship is a perfect example of that. It is one of the world's great mysteries. It has confused and confounded men and women for centuries and centuries, and yet it has not been perceived to have cr critical impact on either the life of the family or the survival of the family. 
I mean, do you? Uh, oh, absolutely. And then you said one other thing here I wanted to quote. As women, our historical role has been to clean up the mess. Whether it's the mess left by war or death or children or sickness, I think the violence you see in plays by women is a direct reflection of that historical role. We are not afraid to look under the bed or to wash the sheets. We know that life is messy. Uh, and you feel that this is something that men do not fully, fully understand and appreciate uh, for the most part. Well, I think that, I think that men are... Um, <laughs> making the mess, if you know what I mean. I mean, men, men are doing the shooting, doing the kills, staging the wars, doing that. I mean, that that kind of conquering, that kind of uh, that that kind of uh, need to triumph, need to make a mark, need to get more territory, need to be, to, you know, that um, that kind of acquisitiveness. Um, I mean, women, the women that I know, are not interested in that. And it's not, uh, that doesn't make us um, less valuable. It's just not something that we're interested in. I, I did not, uh, you know, arrive on the earth with the idea that I had to make my mark, you know, uh, or that I had to, that I had to, and I still don't have the sense that I have to um, be victorious, that I have to win anything uh, or beat anybody. I mean, this is just a difference in the way that, I mean, women have, have other um, values that are, um, that have much more to do with long-term survival, uh, that have much more to do with the, um, the protecting and uh, the protecting of a kind of central core of human existence, of, a feeling of, uh, you know, of passing on valuable information. Um, Let me ask you a question about you as a writer, mm. because you now have a son, mm. Angus. Right. Uh, you're a mother at right. this point. You right. wrote a lot about the mother-daughter relationship in the past, in right. both Getting Out right. and in Night Mother and elsewhere. But now you have this son. Has that changed your attitude toward? Uh, uh, has it changed? Well, first of all, has it been a problem in terms of your writing, in terms of time and attention? Well, I've had to get a lot better. <laughs> I've had to. <laughs> I've had to you know, you know, I really, I. It used to be in my life that I didn't want to do anything but work. And that's not true anymore. I really love to be with this little boy. I really love to watch him learning the language, sort of as he says, sort of devising it, you know. I mean, he, uh, I, I find that more interesting than anything I know. Uh, and I, I... So that writing is not now, the, it doesn't occupy the position of priority that it did once in your life quite so... Well, now I have a choice. All right. This is how it is. Before I didn't. Before it was all about work. Um, and that was very easy. And I was very fortunate because I got a lot of work done in that time. Uh, but uh, more fortunate that I didn't uh, uh, get out of my life without having this little boy. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I know that the work that I've done in the last year has been as good as anything I've ever done. Um, I... Um, like I said, it's just the choices just are harder. Now. You but you know what I find is that w w more and more of us are working with uh, w women who also have children. You know, so that in fact we all make our decisions based on what's easy for us and good for us. And you know, when when we um, have work experiences, it's easy to, you know, I mean, we we're looking out for that. How can we do our work and be with our children? Because we, you know, we will not say that our work is more important than our children. When you are, in terms of your work patterns now, mm -hmm. um, now do you write, you used to, I think you, do you write in longhand and then use the computer or do you use the computer to start with or how do you, a word processor? Uh, how do you write it's just? Still, it's really still the same. I use the computer for the simple things. I use the longhand for the really uh, tough emotional moments. Now, what do you, now explain that just a little bit when you say the simple things. Well, I mean, if I'm doing, if I'm, if I'm uh, doing a cast list, you know, if I'm to watch this, see, I mean, my hands immediately <laughs> begin to go. Uh, you know, if I if I want to do a sketch of a scene, if I want to make, um, you know, th that kind of work. But when I come to something that's a very difficult thing to say, when I'm looking for exactly the right, um, well, if I'll give you an example from Sarah and Abraham. There's a moment when the actor says to her, uh, it's, it's when Abraham says to Sarah, only they're talking as Cliff and Kitty, he says... Oh, you know, I, I have to come by the house sometime and get some things. And she says, not the cat. And he says, ten years together and all you want is the cat. And she says, 
what she says next is one of those things you can only write in longhand, right? I mean, because you think about it for days, you can't just, and what she says is, uh, it's not all I want, but the rest of it won't sit in my lap. Right? Right. Now, the, the, I mean, the, that's not There's a, no way that it would no, have come out on the no, word processor. No, never, yes. never. Does the sort of tactile notion yes. of writing right. there right. mean something to right. you at a moment like, or in a situation like right. that? Right. It also, uh, you know, I, I think that people can comprehend at about the same speed that the human hand can write. And I, I mean, I think that on a computer, you, uh, when I first got my computer years and years and years ago, I, I, was, uh, I fell right into the trap of writing great, long, complicated, fancy sentences that the computer appreciated and that were just, you know, left everybody else cold. Particularly on stage. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're in your typical writing day, uh, dealing with Angus on your son on the one hand and your writing uh, projects on the other, do you have a sort of, do you divide it up or do you? Is, is well, it's, it, it's, it's actually uh, easy. You know, I get up in the morning and, uh, you know, we have that sort of morning family time and then at 9 o'clock or whatever, I go out to my little writing house and... Uh, Angus is in the care of a wonderful uh, girl, and uh, they play in the mornings, and I work in the morning, and then he has his nap, and then, uh, you know, about 1.30, when I'm really finished for the day anyway, yes. I can't do anything for, I mean, I, I'm lucky if I can write. Well, for I think most three writers in a, from the creative standpoint right. cannot write, but a certain period, and you write in the mornings right. then. Right, and then, so then the afternoon is free for, you know, various things, reading, adventure, the beach. No, whatever it that, happens to be. Yeah. But you have a separate place where you write yes. that's away from the yeah. house yeah. Uh, and yes. that you've set up for, yes. for yourself. Yes. It's is the that's the proverbial important. room of my own. That, yeah, and that's important critical. to you? Well, I also, it isn't just for the writing. I need a certain amount of solitude in a day. And four hours is, a, is about the minimum that I have to have. And it doesn't, isn't that I'm, it's a, it's, I don't, I can't really say what it's about that time, but I know it's absolutely critical. It's as critical as eating as critical as sleeping, is for there to be, for there to be no noise for that time, for there to be nobody around. Um, that's what, I, it's part of the, it's part of what's required. Uh, it's always been that way. I mean, now I've gotten to where I can kind of get along on four hours of solitude in a day. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I used to have lots more. Right. Uh, but this is a way that I can also have some, some company in right. my life. I don't have to just have the solitude. And have, and have a balance yeah. between the two. Yeah. Right. The, uh, there's another play you've been working on, which I think is a musical, yes. Secret Garden. Yes. What, uh, just uh, describe briefly what that's about. The Secret Garden is a, is a book by a woman, a novel by a woman named Frances Hudson Burnett, who also wrote uh, The Lord Fauntleroy and The Little Princess. Um, this is a, it's a great favorite among uh, people the world over, this book. And um, I wanted to work on a musical project. I wanted to work with uh, my friend Heidi Landisman, who's done a number of musicals. And uh, Heidi had this... Uh, project in mind and we got together and started working on it and it's been thrilling. I'm doing the book and the lyrics. Uh, talk about craft. I mean, a musical book is just a nightmare of craft. I feel, you know, it's so intricate and so demanding. But, and lyrics, of course, I've always wanted to do. I've always thought. Strange. Have you written them before? Well, I have, but not for publication. You know, I, I, I've always wanted to do it. I grew up, as you know, at the piano, played my way through college on music scholarship. I mean, I, I that, I've always wanted to be there in the musical theater. I feel like I, I took a kind of odd way in, you know. <laughs> um, came up the back stairs. <clears throat> but, um, but this has been going through workshop process. Right. You, we, you we worked on it for, uh, oh, I suppose, a year and a half and then had uh, a workshop. And uh, the next stage is, of course, a regional production and then based scene. You know, then we'll see where we are after that. Speaking of regional production, you, because I would like for you to talk just a little bit about your experience and your notion of where the theater is right now, uh, as far as the regional theater is concerned, or and New York and uh, mm. Off Broadway and this sort of thing, because you've worked at the Actors Theater of Louisville, where your plays were first done, right. at the Mark Taper in Los Angeles, at the ART in Boston. What are the pros and cons, as far as you're concerned, of working? in the regional theater right now for a writer. Right. Well, uh, the best part is that you get to um, have, a, have a real life. You get that, that pleasure of the work itself, which you don't generally get in New York because everybody vanishes at the end of the day. There's lots, it's hard to get there. It's hard to get back. It's, uh, you know, the, the rehearsal hall always in New York um, contains the, that restlessness and anger and frustration of the city. 
um, at, you know, in Boston or in Louisville. I mean, you can, you, you can go get to the rehearsal easily. You enjoy the time there. You can go out for drinks with people later. It's a, you know, you get to actually live There's more the theatrical really. life. Yes. Right. You get um, a feeling of being wildly appreciated. Um, you have that. It's the one place where you can kind of enjoy being a living playwright um, because, um, <laughs> I mean, lots of the rest of the time you think, well, it would be better to be the dead playwright, you know, right. because you... Uh, then you wouldn't have to worry about what happened to your work. <laughs> well, in terms of the circumstances, have you had both good and bad experiences in terms of directors and actors sure. and other things? Sure, sure. I mean, I mean I've had uh, uh, brilliant experiences, times when things couldn't be better, and times when, in fact, there were mistakes in casting and uh, bad choices in terms of directors. Uh, there have been, you know, I mean, I've had uh, the situation of, uh, I mean, I had, there was a Los Angeles run of a play of mine that virtually uh, caused me to stop writing plays for three and a half really? years. I mean, it was such a bad experience, not not just the experience in the theater, but the, my treatment at the hands of the critics was so brutal, and I was, I was very vulnerable at the time, and I just thought, I don't need this. And in fact, I didn't need that. You know, I mean, I think that this is what the critics and the theatrical establishment kind of d doesn't understand quite, is that w very few of us really need to work in the theater. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it uh, is an indulgence at best. Well, a talented writer, for right. example, can make a right. lot more in television and right. film. And be treated better yeah. and given, you know, I mean, uh, there, uh, this is not to say that it's, it's certainly not a perfect world working in television and film, but there, the audience is there. Um, and, uh, and there's a great need for the work, which in the theater you begin more and more to, you know, you wonder more and more. Uh, well, gee, I mean, the theater, what the theater doesn't need now is plays with more than four people in them. <laughs> I mean, for example, yes. you know, I mean, the theater's become increasingly limited in what it can do. Um, simply, I mean, the New York theater, at any rate. And I but think... regional theater is not quite so constricted. It's not quite so constricted, but I think it's going to get, um, I, I mean, the... I th I th regional theater at this moment is in a kind of compression period. There was, a, there was the moment of its birth. It was sort of like supernova, right? And then there was suddenly this explosion, and there were all these theaters and all this money for writers and all these new plays being done and all these festivals and, all, and everything. Uh, and then suddenly uh, there was, a, the, you know, it, the, 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 the star sort of reached its um, critical mass and began to shrink again, and I think the individual theaters are now, Actors Theater is a perfect example. John um, is now... John Jory, John the Jory artistic director, yes. ...is now t devoted to his audience and his own interests. He is not courting the outside world in any overt way. He, yes, he's commissioning plays from writers of renown, but he's not, he doesn't want them for anything other than the, 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 uh, edification of his own audience. Yes. You know, so I think that that's exciting. That, I mean, I, I went back to Louisville two years ago to do Sarah and Abraham and loved being back there again. I, I think that, um, in a sense, the, the regional theater uh, world is, where, is now where it should have been all along, which is only the people who really uh, have to write for the theater will write for the theater. Are, are you one of those who have to write for the theater? Well, I find it fabulous you know i i because you've been doing a lot more television right. and film writing right well but the theater is i mean i think with the, with uh, the opportunities now to write for tv and and film uh people who like the theater who kind of have it as their indulgence and their hobby uh can say well okay what can the theater do that nobody else can do you know i mean it's a kind of a moment when you think well all right, we, and I, we'll go back to the tricks. We'll go back to the illusion. I mean, this is my idea in Sarah and Abraham. You start with a dusty old rehearsal hall, and you end up with a Bronze Age desert kingdom and people that, you know, got into costume and makeup while, you know, the lights never went off, and you don't know how the, how did they do that. Yeah. So, so it's that kind of, how did they do that, that, that uh, uh, we can do in the theater. In terms of musicals, I feel there, nothing is better than live singing and dancing, nothing. And... Um, you can't do that on um, film and, uh, and TV as well. So that, um, like I said, the people who belong in the theater, um, who are, you know, just certified to addicts. Uh, <laughs> but they obviously, they obviously see certain, despite the problems of financial problems and the other problems that you mentioned, uh, they continue to write because of that electricity and that 
excitement and the chemistry that happens. Also, the fact of the audience. How do you, don't you, I mean, it must mean something to you to be in the theater when the audience is experiencing one of your plays that you don't get, obviously, with film and television. Right, exactly, exactly. I did a novel. I loved the writing of it. It was a moment when I was once again angry at the theater, so I went, I went uh, off and wrote this piece that, you know, where I didn't have to deal with anybody. It was but called me. The Fortune Teller, right, wasn't it? Right, yes. And I liked that, but, but it, there was never an opening night, <laughs> no? You could never go out and drink with any of the people in it, right? I mean, you were just there with your book. Uh, so I think that uh, I, the theater is, is a way that I provoke a lot of the conversations I want to have in my life, you know? Uh, it's a way that I get into the rooms I want to be in. Um, and so but I will always need to have those conversations and be in those rooms, and so I will probably need to keep writing. Fortunately, you can work in both worlds, that mm -hmm. is, in the world of film and television, where mm -hmm. you are in demand, and in the theater, which you can come back to. Actually, I suppose working in film and television has made it possible for you in recent years to continue to work in the theater. Absolutely. I Absolutely. mean, from a financial standpoint, right. is that true? Right, right. Is I that mean, true? Uh, and I, this is not just true for me, but I think for most of us now, uh, in my generation of people writing for the theater, I mean, we will do one or two um, pieces of television or film in a year, and that will take six months of our time, and then the rest of the time we will have... You know. To work on theater Yeah, so pieces. we get a two-for-one day. You know, you, <laughs> <laughs> you get two days for the price of one, so you get the second day free to do whatever you like. Uh, and that's the deal that most of us make and how and, we live. You know yes. I mean? We're adults. We don't want to, you know, we have families. We have things. We have, we, yeah, we don't want to be under the pressure of, of, uh, of not having any money. Right. I mean, we've all been there. On that note of the life that you've been able to work out and that fortunately for theater goers, you're going to continue to live, I trust. We have to close now. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with Thank us, you. Marcia. This has been the Harold Clarman Seminar on Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and our guest has been Marcia Norman. Thank you for being with us.